Well, ladies, it is great to be with you today. I am. Uh, I love to teach God's Word, and I'm uh, so happy that uh, that you're here and that we can share this time together. I gave you a map to kind of give you a uh, so that you could see where we are today. We're going to be in. We're not going to be in Ephesus, but um, we're going to talk about. Uh, the, Ephes the, the letter that was written to the Ephesians. Ephesus is, a, at, at the time of uh, the writing of this letter, was a very prosperous, proud, rich, busy port. And as you can see, it's right there on, uh, uh, in Asia Minor, and it is on the port of the Aegean Sea and uh, the Mediterranean Sea. So it was a, a great passageway from, uh, from to, for Rome. And of course, at this, at this time, the uh, Roman Empire is ruling. And um, Paul has found himself in prison because as he's writing the book to Ephesians, and if you've read the whole book of Acts, you know the story of his imprisonment. And this, the, the uh, second missionary journey is outlined for you on this map. And uh, Paul came to Ephesus and he only stayed, I think that is in chapter 18 of Acts, he only stayed a very short while and he left Aquila and Priscilla there. And he left them and then he said, I will be back. I will be back, but I must go down. And he went down to Caesarea and Jerusalem. And you see those down at the bottom of the map, down in the right-hand corner, you see Jerusalem. And then he leaves and goes back and journeys uh, on the third missionary journey. It is not outlined on this map. But he goes all the way through and visits the places where he had been. And then he stops at Ephesus. And uh, if you read the um, if you read those chat the eleventh and the nineteenth and twentieth chapters of Acts, you you read about the time that Paul was in Ephesus and all of the many things that happened to him. And uh, he uh, while he was there, it uh, there was all kinds of all kinds of things happening and turmoils and he he but he continued even though there was much unrest among a lot of the people, um, he was um, there, stayed there. The people, I think, gave him protection. Because you read where that, that riot that they were having, that uh, they were so concerned that their, their Ephesian statues were not going to be able to be sold, that uh, people were turning to Jesus you read in the 19th chapter where they burned their books. Many of their sorcery are their books that they no longer believed in. And uh, Paul had had, Christianity had had a great impact on the people there. And um, but Paul is, and then you read, if you read the 20th chapter, that skipped over to the Ephesian elders where he met with them for the very last time. It's probably one of the most emotional um, readings that you'll find in the Bible because these people, you saw how they dearly loved Paul and how he, how he reciprocated that love because he truly loved those people also. And uh, so the, uh, the very first mention that we have of the, of the apostle uh, Paul he was called Saul. You remember that was in chapter 9 of Acts. If you remember his conversion, what was Saul doing in chapter 9? The very first off of chapter 9. He was on the road to get Christians. Yes, he was, going to, he was going to bring them back and put them in jail because he believed he was very a very staunch Jew, very learned. He had, he had learned the way from Gamaliel and he was, uh, he was on his way, and of course, if you've read that chapter, you know that uh, God came to him, told him to go into uh, to, um, 
the town of Damascus in there, he would be told what he was to do. And then you read of Ananias and how he went to Saul and his conversion there. And uh, of course, Ananias was a little bit afraid to go because he had heard all the things that Saul had been Paul, his now name, his name is Paul, that he had been doing. And he was a little fearful. But God told him, no, you go. He is going to be mine. And someone has Acts 9, 15 to 16, if you'd read that for us. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. You remember when Jesus was on the earth, he went or he went to the Jews. His, his primary mission was to seek and save the lost and to help the Jews to realize that he was the Messiah, that he was the Son of God, that had been prophesied all through the Old Testament. And uh, Jesus, the three years that he spent on earth, he did his best to try to tell the people. And now that... Uh, the, uh, the, the Jewish people, some of them are turning into Christianity, but many of them are still very much opposed to the Christian way of life. And Paul is, is going to be the person to take the uh, gospel to the Gentiles. And of course, he was, he was of um, Gentile heritage because his father was not a Jew. His mother and grandmother were both Jews, but um, he had, so he was, he was very much, he knew the culture. And you know, at this time, as you look on this map, you can see that the Romans had uh, provided, had provided a way of travel. They had made it possible with, uh, for transportation to be by, by land and by sea. And because there were roads that went through all the countryside, and uh, and the uh, the Greeks, if you remember that uh, that dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, and he said there were going to be four kingdoms: there was going to be the Babylonian, there was going to be the Persian, Medo-Persian, there was going to be the Greek, and there was going to be the Roman. Well, at this time, we're down to the very fourth of those kingdoms, and. Uh, they have each benefited the land and the people because the Greeks brought a language. And now Paul can go and he can teach and people can understand what he's saying because he can, because nearly all of the people in this day and at this at time could speak the Greek language. And so he is, Paul is very uh, interested in going to the Gentiles and in telling them. And so we uh, look at the book now of Ephesians, and uh, we're going to see that it is, it is a very different letter, and many of the Bible scholars and theologians, and, and uh, you know, sometimes when you, you begin reading all those, you get a little bit confused. You know, but they're they're of a mind, and of course, when you read this, you don't read anything personal. He does not address any personal person, which is very different from most of Paul's letters. Most of them, they are addressed to a certain person, or he talks about different people. But he does not do that in the book of Ephesians. So, whether this was a letter that was to be circulated to all the churches, it seems to be that that's the theme of the book. Because the very theme of uh, the book of Ephesians is unity. And as I was reading this today, I thought, wow, how wonderful that is to have a book on unity at this time. Because it seems that we've, been, we've all been separated. We've all been all this last year. There's not been a great deal of unity because everybody's had to be at their own place and do their own thing. And uh, the Ephesian letter is going to be encouraging the unity that we have in Christ, the first three chapters, and then the last three chapters, the unity that we have in the church. 
And Paul, uh, Paul did not want there to be a Gentile church and a Jewish church. He wanted there to be the church of Christ. He wanted us all to be united in Christ. And that is his pleading, as we uh, will see as we read in this book. And uh, let's notice in the very, at the very, very beginning, the very first words are, Paul, an apostle of Christ, by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. And I want you to notice that phrase. And if you have a pencil, you might want to underline every time Paul says, in Christ, in him. And you're going to underline a lot because it, that phrase is going to be used a great deal, especially in the first three chapters. You're going to see that. And so he is addressing this to the faithful people that are in Christ Jesus. So if we understand that from the very beginning, then as we get on down into uh, uh, chapter, verses 3 through uh, 14, it will give a meaning to what Paul is saying. If we can remember that this letter is written to the people who are in Christ Jesus. And he says, grace and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I always, and you've seen me do this before when I thought, but grace is, um, you know, and this will kind of fit into the lesson that we've had with Debbie, because, uh, and I got this out of, out of my husband's notes one time a long time ago, but grace is God's riches, at, I couldn't remember, at Christ's expense. And because of what Jesus did, what Jesus did in his life and on the cross, we have, we have grace, God's grace. And what would you say grace is? Unmerited, unmerited, unmerited favor. Yes, and by that we just know we know that we're not worthy. We know that we don't deserve it, but He did it for us anyway. He did it for us anyway. And so He begins by saying, "Grace and peace to you from God our Father." You know that I'm coming. I'm coming from God. I'm coming from my Father, and uh, that. Uh, the things now that I'm going to say have been given to me by God. They've been given to me by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let's look at the first, um, let's look at the first six verses. And notice, notice the, the, the wording that is used and uh, well, praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. So who did we say, who is, who is Paul talking to? Who is Paul writing to? Christians. Christians, yes. The people who are in Christ. And so from... His, uh, we see here that uh, he says that uh, to the faithful, all right, and uh, that to the faithful in Christ Jesus. What does it, what does it take to be faithful? 
How would you describe faithful, to be faithful in Christ Jesus? If you are, you're going to receive what we've just read. To be faithful, you do what? You're here on Sunday, Wednesday morning. That's one thing, all right? You're here. What he wants us to do. Right. How to serve him and to okay, okay. I'm going to be a student of his book. Right. You know, this is my this is this is God's rule book, and these are the things that God wants me to do. So I'm going to be a student of his book. I'm going to I'm I'm going to uh, uh, you know if I I want to learn to I want to learn to drive. I've got to go to the rule book. I've got to see what the rules of the road are. I've got to know, and it's the same way with being faithful. If I'm not sure. What I'm supposed to do, God's word will tell me. If I will be a student of his word, he will tell me. And as a result of that, look what's going to happen to me. I'm going to be blessed with every spiritual blessing. How many is every? <laughs> that's, just, that's all of it, isn't it? I'm going to be blessed. He is going to bless me for he chose us in him. So this is not this is not telling me that uh, you know there is a uh, there is a there is a doctrine that teaches that um, only a few only those who are chosen are going to be saved. But this is not what he's saying. He is saying that every spiritual blessing chose in him from the creation of time. God knew from the very beginning that those that were in him, those that were in him, would receive every spiritual blessing. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons. When you are in Jesus Christ, you have been adopted as his son. And uh, as it brought out in one of the one of the uh, study things that I was reading, that if you were a Roman, you would really understand adoption because you were, if you were, uh, even if you were a slave and you were adopted into a family, you were considered part of that family. And so we have been, and we know what adoption means today, that you become part of a family, right? And when you are adopted into a family, and that's what Jesus says. When you became, when you are in Christ, then you, uh, you have, uh, and these, and then look as a result of being adopted in Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Okay, God has, has when you, and you remember in, the very first sermon that Peter preached in Acts 2. And he told the people when they became, they began to realize what they had done when they crucified Jesus. And they were pricked in their hearts. They were thought, oh my, what have we done? And what did he tell them to do? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Father, the Son, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, in him, look at verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Look at those, look at those great words, riches, lavished. Um, uh, those are just... Uh, those are just very special words that tell how much God loves those that are in Christ. Someone has 1 Peter 1, 18. If you would read that. You have it? Okay, would you read it? Of a lamb without 
who verily was ordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him did believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in him. Okay, so because through Jesus, because of his great sacrifice, because of his great sacrifice uh, in verse 7, we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And in accordance with the riches of God's grace, He, God knew and God did this for us so that we could have the uh, forgiveness of our sins and um uh, and he lavished on us all wisdom and understanding so that uh, from the very beginning, we see that God had a plan. He had a plan for man through his son that he would redeem the world. And those that were in Christ, he would have, uh, they would have these tremendous blessings of his, um, that he has given to us. And he made known, in verse 9, and he made known to us the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put in effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. And God knew that when that certain time would come, and in Galatians in uh, Galatians 4, and you can just turn your Bibles, I think, two pages, and you'll be at Galatians 4, and you might want to follow along. Someone has Galatians 4, 4 through 6. Did I give that to someone? But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might bring those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Okay, so when God, when the time was right, because all through the Old Testament, all the, the um, why I say the Bible is God's story, because he is really, from the very beginning of time, God knew that there would be a plan of redemption. God knew that man would falter, that man would sin, and that there would need to be something to uh, a sacrifice given for his sins, and and so he uh, so from the so the mystery was that he was sending his son, and the mystery is that now even the Gentiles can know that everybody remember he told back in Genesis twelve he told. He told Abraham, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. Yeah. And there's going to be as many stars up there in the sky as there are people. And from the very beginning of time, God knew that he would have a redemptive plan for man. And uh, he, uh, he believed, and look at uh, Romans 4, uh, Romans 3. Look over to the, on the next page. And uh, someone has three, um, 26. Yeah, I do. Galatians, is it, is it in Galatians 3? Uh-huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Galatians 3, 26 through 29. <clears throat> For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have, have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay, so from um, so we can see through here that from the very beginning of time, God had, as I said before, God had a plan, and it uh, that plan the uh, to be in God's plan, you must do what? You must be in Christ. You must be in Christ. the The Jews first heard this, and uh, 
they uh, but but they were not they were not interested they were not interested because if they uh, if they addressed and if they believed all the things about the Messiah what would happen to their way of life because the priests were no longer needed why right? because they were not they uh, when uh, when Jesus died in that curtain fell as we as we talked about a couple few weeks ago then the Jewish dispensation it was ending it was ending and now Paul it is his responsibility and his duty to go and talk to these Gentiles and help him to see that they too can be in Christ that they will be in him you were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. So he is, he is addressing these people now, these Ephesians, you Ephesians who have been baptized, you Ephesians who heard the word, you are now, uh, you are now in God's marvelous plan. You are in his purpose and in order uh, that uh, you too are included in Christ. You've heard the word. And in verse 13, you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. You know, if you were a, you were a Roman and you were sending an official letter and you marked it with a seal, what did that mean? It was authentic. It was authentic. It was from you. And so that, uh, you know, if you, were, if you were a Roman, if you were an Ephesian, you might understand that a little better because we don't usually, we don't seal with wax anymore. <laughs> you know, we, we, just lick the, we just lick the envelope and seal it and put a stamp on it, you know. And, but that stamp shows that it is official. You know, that is the official seal of a letter today. But um, this is that, that seal is the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit <clears throat> guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are in God's possession to the praise of his glory. So, so the... Um, we all understand a, um, you know, a, a deposit. If we put, uh, if we put a, uh, if I put a deposit, if I put a, a uh, on a piece of property, that's telling the person that I'm going to buy that house from, what is that? You're saying you're, you're serious. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do it. Yeah, yeah I'm going to do it. You, I, that's going to be my seal. That's and. And your approval, your signature, is going to be the guarantee that this is going to happen. And that's exactly what this is. That I, the Holy Spirit, remember when he that believeth and is baptized shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God lives inside. And you all know how many, how many times I've said this, that when I taught children, you know, I told them, God's right here. He's just right here. You can't get very far away from that elbow, you know, and he's right here with us all the time. He's just, you know, and, and every, sometimes I just, uh, you know, kind of take hold of my, you know, and, and talk to God, you know, because he's just that close to us. He's put his spirit in us, and he said it is a guarantee. It is a guarantee that you are mine, that our inheritance until the redemption of those who are in God's possession in praise and glory that he is going to be there, he's going to be with us, he's going to help us, that uh, we are a part of God's plan. And um, are there any questions about that, that uh, whole first paragraph? I think that uh, in the very beginning, and in some translations, there aren't any periods. There aren't, it's just one whole long sentence. Of Paul's, and uh, it is a, it is uh, 
you know, every, every, every once in a while, or if, it, if at a time when you're feeling detached, or, or if you just read verses 3 through 14, it should give you great comfort to know that God has lavished his grace on us. He's given us great riches to those who are in Christ Jesus. It is a great thing to be in Christ Jesus. It is great that um, he doesn't say, he doesn't say and put in parentheses anywhere in this that that doesn't mean that there's not going to be trouble. It doesn't mean there's going to be death and destruction and all of the many things that happen in our world. But what does it, but what does it promise? And I'm going to be with you. That whatever might happen to you, that whatever comes in this world, I am near. I am going to be, I am going to be near you with every spiritual blessing and uh, the riches of God's grace that, uh, because I know that, um, that he is, that he is my savior and that he is here and that he is willing to, uh, to help me and to lean on me. If you look now to, um, to the, um, thanksgiving and prayer, this is just as, this is one of the, I think, outstanding beautiful prayers of the Bible that uh, Paul has written and uh, I want to read verses 15 through 20 uh, yeah, through 21 and then we'll stop and go back and talk about the great things that are promised in this prayer for this reason every since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, <clears throat> may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious kingdom, his inheritance in the saints, and his incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule, and authority, power, and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present, but also in the age to come. What a great, um, what a great, and, and you can just imagine that if you're sitting in, a, in the synagogue and you're listening to them say, Paul say, I heard about your faith and I've not stopped praying and giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. You know, it's just, uh, I, I think it's, it's probably the greatest thing we can do for each other, is to pray. You know, I think the greatest, the greatest blessing that we have is that we can pray for each other and that we can remember them. And here Paul says, I've never stopped giving thanks, remembering you in my prayers, and asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, to give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, to help you to understand, to give you understanding and help you to see that you can know him better, you know. And, of course, the only way we can know him better is that if I'm in this book a lot, if I am, if I am in God's word, then I can... Uh, because, um, you know, each time, each time we go to God's Word, we can understand. And I can remember at one time, <clears throat> and this kind of shows my dull brain, I guess, but I never did quite understand what it meant when it said, by the order of Melchizedek, 
you know, I never did get that all, you know, I, I didn't understand that. I didn't understand that at all. And of course, Debbie's going to really, she's going to really help us understand that when she gets to Hebrews. But uh, I didn't. And then all of a sudden, one day, Lonnie was talking, and he was talking, you know, and he said, Melchizedek was not in the bloodline to be a priest. But yet he, is, he did the work of a priest with Abraham in Genesis. You know, and you can go back and find that if you're not sure what I'm talking about. But uh, he was, he acted as a priest, didn't he? And he was not. Well, Jesus acted as a priest. And he was not of the bloodline either. And it finally clicked. <laughs> you know, they weren't of the bloodline. They were not, they were not from Levi. They were, Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. And we don't know about Melchizedek, you know. So, uh, so I, I think that every time, I say that to say this, that every time we go to the Bible, we bring a new understanding. And we can read it, and then we say, now I understand that. Yes, that's what he's talking about. And so I, I hope that, uh, and I want to encourage you to, um, and I know you do, and you wouldn't be here this morning if, if you weren't students of the Bible. But I, um, I know that, that's a, that that helps me begin my day. You know, I've just, and of course, I'm at a stage in my life right now that I can kind of pick and choose my times and, and do things as I want to. And, uh, but um, uh, it's a great way to begin your day is to uh, look at God's Word. And He will help you. He will give you that spirit of wisdom and revelation. As you read and study God's Word, you will understand more and you will be able. And there won't be as many mysteries or as many things that we don't understand. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that your so that you know that your uh, Jesus doesn't want us to have heart trouble. He wants us to have. He has lavished his love on us so that our heart expands with that love and understanding. The hope that he has called you, the great hope that he has given to us, that uh, the hope that we have of being with him someday, the hope we have of. Of, of our lives here together, that uh, the hope he has called you to the riches of his glorious inheritance. I remember one time, a long time ago, this is probably 20 years ago, because I've been here 40 years, and Lonnie, Lonnie had a sermon on this prayer, and he asks us to pray for him, that he would have the hope and the glorious inheritance and the incomparable great power. And those are three great things to, uh, that, that we have, that we understand the riches. And I guess we can't really understand that. We can't really understand how great it is and the glorious inheritance that is ours. You know, Paul says that uh, you, have a, you have a great inheritance and there is an incomparable great power for those who believe. If you... Uh, the power that is like the working of his mighty strength. And we know that it was very mighty because what did he do? He raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at the right hand of him. Jesus is there now and he is hearing our petitions. He's hearing those things and he's there to tell the Father for us. And uh, so we are, uh, as uh, Paul said to the Philippians, in Philippians 3.13, I press on to gain the mark. You know, I'm constantly, when the first year that, uh, the first year that I taught school, which is many moons ago, many, many moons ago, I taught it, I lived in Austin. I taught school in Austin, Texas, two years, my first two years out of college. And I went to a conference that day to a, 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 a gathering of teachers. And the subject was, to journey is to arrive. And that just made it a lasting impression on my life because you don't ever stop learning, right? Life is a journey. And if you've learned it all, <laughs> you know, we don't ever get there, do we? We don't ever. And that's what Paul is saying here, you know, as I press on to learn, you know. 
and as I'm uh, as as I as I grow in Christ, I see I I can understand more and more every day the great hope I have, the great inheritance that is mine, and the great power that is at work. You know, God said I, that uh, Paul said I can do all things through Him who gives me strength, and so. Um, if I'm if I'm feeling kind of helpless one day, I can go to God and ask Him for that. Give me, you know, give me that extra. And he's and verse 22, and He's placed all things under His feet, and appointed Him to be head over everything for the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills everything in every way. So Jesus is uh, the head. He is Lord. He is the Lord of my life. He is the head of my life. He is the head of his body, which is the church. And the uh, when I, uh, I'd like for you to turn to Jude, and you won't have very far to go. It's right at the back, just before Revelation. If you go to Jude, this is just, I think, one of the outstanding verses in all the Bible. And it's one that if you are working with uh, someone trying to teach them God's way, then uh, they can certainly uh, see. Um, Debbie, would you read it for us? Verses 24 and 25 and listen to how great this is. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. The only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. He has found me faultless. That is just, you know, that's, uh, that is, uh, to me, that is just a great thing that God can, uh, that God finds and, and uh, with great joy, you know. And those, again, are those words that, help us to feel so very good. And look now back to 1 Corinthians 15. See, I'm not going over time. No, it's still good. I don't know if we'd have time to do this, but these are great scriptures to help me realize uh, chapter 15, uh, verses 20 and 24, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through man, the resurrection of the dead comes through a man. For in Adam all die. If if Christ did not come, Adam sinned. And Adam, but in Christ all will be made alive. But each to his own term. Christ the first fruits, and then when he when he comes, those who belong to him. When the end will come, then he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, author, and power. So the, uh, the great thing about Jesus' life is that uh, Jesus has overcome. He is forget We are forgiven of the sins that are in this world. And because Jesus died and rose again, we will also. We will not. Uh, we we will we will not have a spiritual death, but we will rise to walk and to live with God. And one more scripture is Second Timothy two. You got to go back the other way. Second Timothy two. And I just think these are great scriptures, so I want everybody to read them with me. Second uh, Timothy two one. Second uh, Timothy two. Chapter 1, verse, um, verse 7, and then verse 10. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. But he has now revealed through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So Jesus has... Because of his death, because of his death, we now 
has brought life. He wants us to have a great life. You know, Jesus said in John 10, 10, I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And he said, is. That's all present tense. God wants us to have a good life now and immortality. We're going to have a good life in the death, in the life to come. One more scripture. First Peter and go back, back the other way. And this just tells again how great it is that we are God's people. And this is 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into a wonderful light. And I won't, and I won't read verse 10. So he has, uh, he has done so much for us. Nothing, Paul told the Romans, nothing can separate us from the love of God. You know, I may separate myself, but God will never be separated from me. And I want to read a little legend in this uh, um, Barclays Ephesian commentary that I read it and I thought, that's very good. And so I want to uh, see if I can find out for sure where it is. Oh, here it is. I'm on the wrong page. Okay. An illustration which is old perhaps, um, and perfectly sums up a great truth. There is a legend which tells us how God went back to heaven after his time on earth. Remember, this is a legend. Even in heaven, he bore upon him the marks of the cross. The angels were, angels were talking to him, and Gabriel said, Master, you must have suffered terribly for men down there. I did, said Jesus. And, said Gabriel, do you all know how you love them? Do they all know how you love them and what you did for them? Oh, no, said Jesus. Not yet. Just now, only a few people in Palestine know. What have you done, said Gabriel? to let everyone know about it. Well, I'll ask Peter and James and John and a few others to make it their business of their lives to tell others about me and others still others and yet others until the farthest man in the widest circle knows what I've done. Gabriel looked very doubtful for he knew well what poor stuff men were made of. Yes, he said, but what if Peter and James and John grow tired? What if the people who come after them forget? What if way down in the 20th century, people just don't tell others about you? I haven't made any other plans. I'm counting on them. To say that the church is the body means that Jesus is counting on us. And that concludes our lesson. We'll do chapter 2 tomorrow, next week.